student pilot takes off for an hour of solo air work. He'll spend part of it practicing stalls. You know what a stall is and how to recover from it. You learn just like this student in your first few hours of instruction. All pilots know it, or knew it once. Yet stalling accidents occur on the average more than once a day. They account for about a quarter of the general aviation accidents. Why do pilots who know better get themselves involved in stall accidents? Not just the students and low-time pilots, but the average pilots and even the old hands with a thousand hours or several thousand. This film will review the information you need to know about stalls and about spins, when they're most apt to occur, how to recognize the onset, and how to recover safely. Let's make clear right from the outset that you can stall at any power setting, at any normal airspeed, and in any attitude. Most pilots think of a stall as something that only happens when you slow down your airspeed, like this. But you can also stall like this. High speed, sudden control movement, and stall. A little review of theory will explain the factors involved. Consider this airfoil as the aircraft goes into a glide. The flight path is like this, and the relative wind affecting the wing is like this. The angle between the cord line of the airfoil and the relative wind is the angle of attack. Within limits, if you coordinate changes of attitude with changes in power setting, the angle of attack remains the same, providing the speed remains constant. But any time you change power while holding the attitude constant, the angle of attack changes. And any time you change attitude while maintaining the power setting, the angle of attack changes. Ordinarily, there's no need to think about angle of attack when you fly. You get on perfectly well without drawing diagrams in your head. It's only when the angle of attack becomes quite large that it gets to be a problem. The smoke tunnel lets you see what happens. First, from level flight, we pull up the nose. The angle of attack increases until finally the air can no longer flow smoothly over the wing. This is the critical angle of attack, and the result is reduction in lift, and the aircraft stalls. Now watch. The same thing can happen when you're in a climb. It can happen when you're in a glide. And it can even happen when you're in a dive. For a particular airfoil section, the critical angle of attack is always the same. No matter what the attitude, power, and airspeed, the airfoil will always stall if it reaches the critical angle of attack. The important point is this. It's wrong to think of a stall as something that happens at a particular airspeed. The speed at which the stall occurs depends on a number of things. For example, remember that stall speed increases with G loading. In this aircraft, flaps up, the stall speed in level flight is 72 miles per hour. The G loading of a 20 degree bank increases the stall speed slightly. At a 40 degree bank, the stall speed jumps appreciably. Here's a bank of 60 degrees. Look at the stall speed. Another factor that has a bearing on stall speed is weight. This aircraft, with fuel tanks half full, one person on board, has a stall speed of 65 miles per hour. But at max growth weight, the stall speed goes up to 70 miles per hour. Also, stall speed may be lowered on most aircraft by extending the flaps.
Curiously enough, power setting also affects stall speed. The reason is that prop thrust induces additional air velocity over part of the wing, giving a little extra lift. Cut the power, and that extra lift disappears, thus increasing the stall speed. Here's where it can make a difference. You've let the airspeed get somewhat low, and suddenly you realize you're a good bit too high. So you chop the power. Wave off and go around. The moral is, don't chop power when you're too slow because power affects stall speed. Enough of the theory, let's get on to the flying. First topic, how do you know when you're approaching a stall? One way is from the stall warning device in the aircraft. Another method is the stall warning light. But you don't always have to rely on mechanical systems. The aircraft itself may tell you when it's approaching or entering a stall, and you should learn to recognize the signs characteristic of aircraft you fly. The controls become mushy as you near a stall. Because of the reduced airflow, control effectiveness is reduced, and it takes an extra amount of displacement to produce a given response. In some situations, you may also be able to hear the approaching stall. As the airspeed decreases, the engine sound changes and the wind sound decreases. Listen. A heads-up pilot learns to use sound cues in a lot of ways. Some aircraft give another kind of indication of an approaching stall. They begin to buff it. As for what happens when the aircraft enters the stall, you don't have to be told about that. You already know that normally, in most aircraft, the nose pitches down and one wing may drop. These actions are usually more pronounced when you stall with power on. However, it doesn't always happen like that. Some aircraft can stall without a clean break. Picture this situation. You're on downwind behind a slower aircraft, and you've reduced power to keep from running him down. You realize you're losing altitude. So you add a little power and come back on the elevator. No effect. This time you pour it on and haul way back. Still going down. But look at your airspeed. You're in a stall. In this situation, the aircraft just mushes down. Power and back pressure won't help. You'll keep going down until you take definite recovery action. Which brings us to the next point. How to recover from a stall. The exact technique varies somewhat from one aircraft to another. But the general principles are the same. First, reduce back pressure. Second, add full power. Third, level the wings with coordinated use of controls. Here's the way it goes. You enter a stall. Applying forward pressure decreases the angle of attack. Remember, if you add power while holding back pressure, the nose will tend to rise, aggravating the stalled condition. Use full power. Don't overboost a supercharged engine, of course, but unless planned otherwise for training purposes, use full power. Then level the wings with coordinated use of aileron and rudder and recover to the desired flight attitude. The procedure is essentially the same for any type of stall. Here's an approach stall, flaps down, power off, gliding in a turn. Wheel forward, full power, level the wings. The departure stall in a climbing turn. You can expect a more pronounced tendency to roll in a power on stall. The accelerated stall is a special case, since it can happen at any normal airspeed. It most often occurs when the pilot tries to tighten the turn or correct the altitude with back pressure and pulls back too rapidly. It's the increased G-loading that leads to trouble. Recover from the stall first, then level the wings. Excessive or early up elevator use during stall recovery can cause a secondary stall. Spins continue to be a factor in accidents. 
Therefore, you should know what a spin is, how it occurs, and how to recover. The most important thing to know is a spin is an aggravated stall. Aggravated means you're continuing to apply the control pressure which caused the stall, usually back pressure, and possibly rudder. If you enter a spin, there may be a recommended recovery technique for your aircraft, but if it's unknown or not given, the following steps should be taken. Power usually aggravates the stall, so close the throttle. Remember, it's easy to become disoriented in this case. The aircraft is spinning to the left, which makes it appear as if the earth is spinning to the right. So the second step, use full opposite rudder, right rudder in this case. Notice the attitude. The nose is way down, but well short of vertical. Yet from the cockpit, you may get the feeling of heading straight for the ground. It's important to realize this is just an illusion. Because the third recovery step is reduce back pressure with enough brisk forward elevator to ensure recovery. As the rotation stops, release rudder pressure and smoothly apply elevator to raise the nose. The airspeed increases rapidly during recovery. Avoid excessive G-loads, but keep the nose rising steadily to the desired flight attitude. Don't yank. That could overstress the aircraft or cause a secondary stall. Remember that the specific details of spin recovery varies with the type of aircraft. Learn the correct procedures for the aircraft you fly. Earlier, we posed the question, why do experienced pilots become the victims of stall accidents? Let's answer that now by looking at some of the common situations that account for the once-everyday accident rate. The most common underlying reason is distraction. The pilot's attention is diverted because he's searching the ground or studying a chart or checking on some malfunction, and he forgets that his number one task is to fly the airplane. That's particularly a problem when you're flying close to the ground for search and rescue, cattle counting or roundup and the like. If you must fly at very low altitude, keep ahead of your airplane and avoid extreme maneuvers and sudden control movements. Here's a situation that's gotten many pilots into trouble, taking off from a short field with trees or power lines at the far end. Even when he can clear the obstacle, there's a strong urge to haul the airplane off the ground before it's got flying speed or to try climbing or banking too steeply. Another common cause of stalling is retracting the flaps too quickly before airspeed is above the flaps up stall speed. No time of flight offers more hazards for a stall accident than the approach for landing because you've got so many things to think about at once. Here's a pair of situations that too often head to inadvertent stalls. First, the trim tab stall. The pilot has his aircraft trimmed just right for the approach. Then, realizing he's too high or the runway isn't clear, he decides to go around. He pours the coal to it, forgetting his trim. Forgetting he'll need to hold forward pressure to maintain pitch attitude. The nose pops up, stall. Finally, the cross control stall. The pilot begins a turn onto final and discovers he's overshooting. Now, he's always heard you shouldn't make a steep turn at low altitude. So he decides he'll just skid back to course with rudder. This tends to make a wing drop. He corrects with a little opposite aileron. Then he finds the nose going down, so he applies a little back pressure. As he continues to hold rudder, he finds he gradually needs more and more opposite aileron and back pressure. This is a setup for disaster. One last point, probably the most important point of all, yet the books never tell you. Imagine yourself there in the pilot's seat. You always practice stalls at altitude. But the unintentional stalls often happen near the ground. And here you may forget all the good practice. Technique says, forward on the wheel. But your instinct says, get away from the ground, pull up. Many pilots have become statistics because they listen to instinct in a moment of crisis. Panic is your worst enemy. So what's the answer? Practice. Practice flight at minimum controllable airspeed. An excellent way to keep proficient at recognizing the mushy feel of the controls 
that may warn of an approaching stall. And practice your stalls. Knowing their causes will help you avoid the inadvertent stall. Practice often. Make it a habit to go out and work on stalling for safety.